Good morning and welcome to this hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operation and Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee. Today we are holding a first hearing on Introduction 1288, sponsored by Council Member Ben Kalos in relation to the campaign finance laws to be in effect for cover elections held prior to 2021 uh, primary. The first ballot question for the most recent election introduced changes to our campaign finance system set to take effect with the primary in 2021. This bill will apply changes from that ballot question to all primary, general, and special and runoff elections between now and the 2021 primary. Candidates participating in the matching funds program in this election will have the option to choose between either the new system or the existing system for contribution limits, matching formulas, qualifying thresholds, public fund caps, and distribution schedule. However, some differences from the ballot question will be introduced, such as requiring the additional refunding of certain contributions depending on the option chosen by participating candidate by a participating candidate. Candidates who choose not to participate will continue to follow the existing system during this period. Additionally, in order to account for the shortened time frames of special election, the bill will also lower the threshold to qualify for matching funds in a city-wide special election. Similarly, it will ease the requirements for participating in a city-wide mandatory debate. I want to thank the members of this committee, including the sponsor of this bill, for their commitment to improving our campaign finance system. I also want to thank our committee staff, Brad Reed, Elizabeth Cronk, Zach Harris, as well as Rob Newman, counsel to the speaker, and my own legislative director, Claire McLevain, for all their hard work. I look forward to our discussion on this legislation. With that, I'll pass it on to the sponsor of the bill, Council Member Ben Kalos. Good morning. I'm New York City Council Member Ben Kalos. It is still at Ben Kalos, for those unfamiliar. I would like to start by thanking our chair, Fernando Cabrera, for hearing introduction 1288, and to uh, Council Members Keith Powers and Casa Constantinides, who signed on pre-introduction. On November 6th, New Yorkers voted to get big money out of politics. After a decade-long fight for campaign finance reform, voters took matters into their own hands, voting yes on ballot question one. Over 1.4 million voters turned their ballots over to page four. Uh, so it wasn't actually turning it over. It was actually more difficult than flip your ballot. Uh, and of those people, 1.1 million voted yes on question one. To put in perspective, more people voted in favor of question one than voted for all candidates for mayor in 2017. I think it's just about the same. In 2016, I had authored Introduction 1130, which was co-sponsored by uh, Fernando Cabrera. Uh, campaign finance has been an issue that we've worked together on since I got elected. It had co-sponsorship by 31 members of the city council. It had the support of every, nearly every good government group, countless labor organizations and membership organizations. I want to give a special thank you to reInvent Albany, which was particularly active along with Represent Us. And despite having a hearing as governmental operations chair at the time, it somehow, and, and despite having more than a majority of the members signed on as sponsors, it somehow didn't have the support to be brought to the floor for a vote. Uh, this term, I reintroduced the legislation in uh, late March of this year as Introduction 732 of 2018. And once again, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera answered the call and signed on, and we had 21 sponsors in total, uh, nearly a majority of the council. Uh, and uh, that being said, just as that was happening, the mayor formed a Charter Revision Commission. I have the opportunity to testify in favor of these campaign finance reforms on May 9th, June 19th, July 23rd, and August 9th, calling for reduction in contribution limits, increased matching ratios, and increasing public funds payments, all of which were in part or in whole adopted by the vote on November 6th. However, these changes would not take effect until the 2021 election cycle. 
Introduction 1288 extends the first ballot question on campaign finance reform from only applying in 2021 and thereafter to providing the same option for special elections and the primary election that will follow this year and the general election that will follow this year, along with every single other cascade of election, since everyone running is pretty much an elected official already. Uh, and what would follow, as the chair mentioned, is it was a lower contribution limits from 2000. So contribution limits in special elections are already halved. So it's going from 2550, uh, which is the contribution limit for citywide, to 1000. Uh, from 1975 for borough president to 750, and from 1425 for city council to 500. It will increase the public match for every small contribution under 175 with six public dollars to matching up to $250 for citywide and continuing to match 175 with eight public tax dollars and increasing the public grant for those that opt in from 55% to 75% of the spending limit. For candidates participating in the soon to be called public advocates race, lower contribution limits and increased matching would be retroactive to campaigns that select this option. In addition to applying ballot question one to the special election, the legislation goes further by lowering the minimum funds raised threshold to qualify for a public grant by half, just as other limits are halved. The threshold for mayor is halved from 250,000 to 125,000 and for public advocate and controller from 125,000 to 62,500. Only the first 250 of an individual of New York City resident's contribution is applied towards meeting the dollar amount threshold. Participating candidates would still need to collect the same number of contributions of 1,000 for mayor and 500 for public advocate. A candidate for public advocate who opts into the new campaign finance system would only need to raise $250 from 1,708 donors to see $427,031 matched at 8 to 1 for a full 3.4 million dollars in public grant, which will give them 75% of the money they need to run for the spending limit, and that will leave them with only 15% left to raise. Uh, and I think one other key point, which was uh, uh, raised by one of my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Kalman Yeager, is in question one, as it was passed, people can still keep over the limit contributions after they opt in. One change we're making to this for the special election is candidates would be bound retroactively. So if they took a contribution for 2,550, they would have to give back 1,550 uh, to participate. Uh, and uh, that being said, I personally uh, hope to uh, opt into question one in January, and I plan to give back any money that I took over the limit for whatever. I am not running for public advocate. Uh, <laughs> uh, are, are you running for public advocate? Uh, the record reflects neither Calvin Yeager or I are running for public advocate. Uh, but that being said, uh, I think it is the uh, right thing to do. Uh, with the reforms, candidates for city office can finally run for office on small dollars and with public dollars to win. I want to take a special moment to thank Rob Newman, uh, Brad Reed, and Elizabeth Kronk uh, for their work on this legislation. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you so much for your leadership. And I um, also want to go on the record that I, I am not also running for public advocate. Uh, so with that, uh, let me turn it over to our Brad also is not running for <laughs> public advocate. So I'll turn it over to Brad uh, for the swearing in. Hi, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good, good morning, Chair Cabrera and members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Amy Lopress, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. I'm joined by Eric Friedman, Assistant Executive Director for Public Affairs. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As you know, New York City's campaign finance program has long been a model for reformers across the United States seeking to limit the influence of money in elections. Our program remains strong because the CFB and the Council have worked together over the past 30 years to make the improvements that further the program's goals of lowering the barriers to run for office, amplifying the voices of small contributors, and reducing corruption or the appearance of corruption. 
the charter amendment overwhelmingly approved by New York City voters in November seeks to build on the program's success, further limiting the corrupting influence of large contributions and making it possible for more candidates to rely on small dollar contributions. The approval of ballot question one was a show of support for the exceptional system that we have built together. One implementation challenge of the Tartar Amendments is that it allows candidates to choose which version of the program they will participate in for the 2021 election cycle. Participating candidates can opt to run under the existing program or option B with contribution limits up to 5,100 for citywide offices and a match rate of six to one up to the first $175 of qualifying contributions or under the new program, option A, with lower contribution limits up to 2,000 for citywide offices and an increased match rate of eight to one for the first $250 of qualifying contributions. Intro number 1288 would offer the same choice to candidates running in the February 2019 special election for public advocate, who would be able to continue fundraising under the existing matching funds program or opt into the new program. The intent of this bill is to further the policy aims we jointly support, limiting the influence of large donors while increasing the value of small contributions. Since the Charter Revision Commission issued its proposals in September, the CFB staff has been working to determine how we will implement these changes for the 2021 elections, particularly the choice between programs. The parallel sets of contribution limits, matching rates, match amounts, and public fund caps will require significant modifications to all of the CFB's major information systems, including our internal database, or KIFIS, the disclosure platforms for candidates, CSMART, and our online fundraising platform, NYC Votes Contribute. Our staff has already begun the extensive work that is needed, and we have been keeping to an aggressive timeline in order to complete it in time for the 2021 elections. Providing the choice for the candidates in the special election compresses our implementation timeline considerably. It is important to be clear about the implications it will have for candidates. Put simply, it's not feasible to complete the work of redeveloping all of our systems before a special election is declared in January. While we work, will work as diligently as possible to make the process run as it usually does, there is a real possibility that we have to operate in two systems. This means that for candidates who choose the existing program, option B, everything will proceed as normal. Candidates who choose the new program, option A, will undergo a more manual and time intensive process. All candidates will be able to file disclosures electronically through CSMART. However, many of the regular administrative reviews done systematically by KIFIS will need to be done manually. For instance, determinations about whether candidates have met the threshold to qualify for public funds and calculations of their matching funds payments may have to be done on paper. This will also affect the manner in which candidates receive public funds. Currently, we conduct payments almost entirely through electronic funds transfer, which is enabled by KIFIS. Because payments for option A candidates will not be calculated in our system, we'll have to pay those candidates by paper check. It typically takes payments by check longer to appear in candidates' bank account, whereas electronic funds transfers clear a candidate's bank account in the same day they are sent. Any delay in the availability of funds during a compressed special election period could potentially make a material difference in a race with a crowded field. Additionally, it is unlikely we will be able to program the regular checks and warnings into CSMART that help candidates with compliance. While we provide comprehensive guidance to candidates, we also recognize that errors happen even with the best training. Without these systemic checks in place, heightened vigilance will be required of candidates and their staff to avoid inadvertent violations and penalties. We also want to be clear that there will be other downstream impacts of manually implementing option A. Because we will be auditing matching claims, determining thresholds, and calculating payments manually rather than systemically, uh, statement reviews for the special election may take longer than they typically would, as will statement reviews for 2021 candidates. This will also take resources away from completing the audits for the 2017 election. We have engaged with the council and worked together on improvements to the bill that will alleviate some of our administrative concerns, although these will not entirely resolve the issues that I outlined above. 
For example, the bill requires the candidates in the special election conduct their entire campaign under the system that they chose, eliminating the January 12th cutoff for 2021 candidates and applying the contribution limits, matching rates, and matchable amounts retroactively to the entire cycle. We believe making this system a straightforward choice will significantly reduce the possibility for human error as we perform our calculations. Additionally, the bill would lower the threshold to qualify for matching funds in special elections so that candidates for citywide offices will only need to raise half the dollar amount as for regular elections, or $62,500 rather than $125,000. This will ensure that candidates can actually get the benefit of public matching funds during a tight special election calendar. Finally, the bill cuts the threshold to qualify for CFB debates in half, which will help ensure that candidates running competitive campaigns will have access to this important opportunity to communicate with voters. Again, we share the aims of intro 1288. We want to be clear about the challenges we will face during the bill's implementation. We appreciate the open communication we've had with our, the council about our administrative concerns. While many issues remain, we want to acknowledge those concerns that were taken into account during the drafting of the bill, which will help simplify the system for candidates running in this special election and for our staff who will be operating with some administrative limitations on this time frame. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions, turn it over to the sponsor of the bill and, and anyone else who have questions today. Uh, but uh, look, uh, we're talking about, ooh, we're talking about, I believe there's 22 candidates uh, out of those 22. I'm estimating probably we're going to end up with 10 of them. Out of those 10, my guess, just looking at their, uh, many, of, many of them already had done uh, fundraising. Uh, some of them have half a million dollars in the bank uh, already. And uh, therefore, they're very less likely uh, to opt in into option A. So if I were to guess, uh, maybe we're talking about uh, five candidates who may opt in. And I have confidence in the CFP. Uh, and I want to thank you for uh, your intentionality that you, you know, in concept, uh, y you believe that uh, what the voters, uh, you know, loudly vote. I don't remember last time we have so many uh, of our constituents vote in a particular issue. Um, so, uh, so I thank you uh, for that and anchoring those sentiments. But if we're only talking about maybe five candidates, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it seems to me that it will be manageable. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I heard your concerns, and you know, they're valid concerns. Uh, but we're only talking about maybe five of them, six. Max, uh, is it uh, is it that we need to hire more people uh, to accomplish this goal? Uh, what what will get us to the finish line? Well, I mean, as I as you know, we will do whatever we can to make sure that the program runs uh, smoothly for the special election. Uh, we have, you know, the difficulty is that you have to run two systems at the same time. And, you know, while we were planning for that for the 2021 election, and we will, it'll be a much more compressed time frame to get it done. You're right. Even if there are only is only one candidate, we'd obviously have to run the second system for that one candidate. So, um, it, you know, so the the challenge is, you know, building a computer system is the same for one person, you know, versus a hundred. Um, so we would still have the same challenges. But of course, you know, we will try and make sure that the system runs as smoothly as possible. We've already begun, you know, thinking about ways to to work the system to make sure that it ru does run smooth smoothly. I just wanted to make sure that the, you and the public were aware that there, you know, there are some, might be some challenges and some risks in the way that we have to accomplish this. And, and I, I appreciate uh, you sharing those uh, challenges because they are real challenges. I, you know, this, we're talking about a short amount of time between now on the special election, and so we, we recognize that. You know, I, I want you to know that we're not 
uh, blind uh, to that. Uh, but I'm also very confident uh, in your capacity and competency uh, to, to be able to, to get this done. And with that, I'll pass it on to uh, the sponsor of the bill, Council Member Ben Kills. I want to acknowledge you we've been joined by Council Member Powers and Council Member Yeager, who was here right from the beginning as always. He, he's always here to the very end as well. I want to start by thanking the Campaign Finance Board for uh, working with us and in the interest of transparency, including some of the great work we were able to do together in your testimony. Specifically, I agree with you. I think that question one should be applied to retroactively, I don't think that people should be able to take large money and then come back in and then participate in a system with less big money and have to compete against people who aren't going to take big money. Uh, and then similarly, I really appreciate working with you to lower the amount of money threshold. I've heard a lot of criticism that candidates for mayor had difficulty reaching that. And so being able to change that citywide is incredibly helpful. Uh, additionally, uh, the chair brought up a question about people who had already raised money. In your post-election review, it seems that the Campaign Finance Board already has an opinion on people who have non-city accounts who already have what in the lingo might call, be called war chests. If you can just share what the Campaign Finance Board's position is on somebody bringing money that is not from a city account into the city system. Uh, what would normally be called a war chest? Um, well, you know, the law has and the, our rules have protections to make sure that any money that's brought from a different camp, raised for, un, for a different campaign, um, follows the same laws and regulations that money that is in, uh, you know, in, that's raised under the current limits. So we uh, analyze any, all of that money that's transferred to ensure that it doesn't include prohibited contributions, contributions that are over the limit, and don't allow those to be transferred into your current campaign. And if we could go further, what was your recommendation, I believe, number 12? You're going to have to make me uh, uh, <laughs> remember. Um, I, I think that, you know, in general, the, the CFB would think that it's probably best for people to start raising their contributions for each election separately. I agree. I would like to get rid of war chests, and I would also like to kill the zombie committees. Uh, those are committees that are formed for an election and then have enormous amounts of money left over for candidates who will never run again or may actually already be dead. Uh, that's why I call them the zombie committees, and uh, I'm all about killing zombies. Uh, the I had only ever heard that just yesterday for the first time, that term zombie committee. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, in terms of uh, one of the items you raised, you indicate you might wish to uh, pay by paper check. Uh, I do not have CFIS. As a candidate for city council, I submitted to you uh, wire transfers because the way that candidates for city council pay for uh, our mail and other uh, covered transactions is through wire transfer because with the timeline from when we get paid in August to when the mail drops a week or two later, the check wouldn't clear as just you mentioned and you have to buy the paper, the ink and send it to tens of thousands of people. Uh, would the campaign finance board similarly rather than using CFIS to automatically generate uh, the uh, wire transfer, be able to go to a bank and manually initiate the wire transfer. I mean, we have the way we do the wire transfers is through this system, and it's through a bank. Obviously, we don't have our own uh, funds. Um, it, that is one of the most uh, challenging, and one of the things that we are working most vigilantly to make sure that that we don't have to issue paper checks because we do understand the implications of that. Um, it, but of course, the payments are the most complicated part of the program, paying people at two different rates, um, up to two different matchable amounts, is the most complicated part of uh, the system and also the place where you want to make sh have the best assurances that you're not doing anything wrong. I'm just narrowly asking about the paper check and if, um, if whether it is a check that is being cut by the controller or the Office of Payroll Administration or if it's being maintained at a different banking institution and if 
there's the capacity to issue a wire transfer outside of the CFIS system. I, I, I just don't know the answer to that question. Well, that's one thing we can look into. I mean, we've just begun to look into all of the administrative. And, and, and just to be fair, you asserted that you would need to do paper check, but you weren't able to answer whether or not uh, the electronic transfer was available. So I just would just say you should, you, I, I would ask in the future that you have the answer that you fully explored on the electronic. In terms of on the CSMART and the CFIS, you're indicating that you're concerned about some challenges with the system changes. How, now, my understanding is that last year, in 2017, the maximum contribution for a citywide candidate was $4,950. Is that correct? Yes. This year, it is now 5100 Is that also correct? Yes. Does C, has CSMART been updated to accommodate the change in contribution limit? Yes. How long did that take? I am not sure. But again, the complication is doing two. I mean, it's, you know, doing one is, it, you know, making one change is different than making it, you know, the change for the same office for the, for the two different limits. Um, so so I, I would argue that right now there are people who have, un so let's just talk about in 2017. In 2017, or, or at least between 2014 and 2017, there were candidates running for city council at the same time as there were candidates running in a special election for council. I believe that my colleague, Rafael Salamanca, had to run in three special elections. Sorry, a special election, a primary, and a general. Uh, so during that point, you were running the option B, and then you were running special election. That special election had different limits. Uh, different everything, so you already have experience running a regular election and an election with completely different rules, do you not? Yes, but those are two different election cycles. Um, so we have to consider all of the all of the places we disclose. So there's public disclosure issues. There are, in addition to the candidate, uh, uh, the you know the candidate's uh, disclosure. So those were those are three different set. Uh, Election, two different election cycles. A special election is a different election cycle than an off-year election. So we're looking at a special election. How long did it take to set up this this C-SMART for the pending election that folks are expecting, though it has not been called back, called yet, because it has new limits, new thresholds, new everything, regardless of the implementation of this law? I mean, that's already been done. How long did it take? I mean, I, I, I don't know the exact number, but it doesn't, changing the limits for one office for one election cycle doesn't take a large amount of time. Again, the complexity is that we're doing two limits at the same time for the same election for the same election cycle. So it's different. Technically speaking, wouldn't it be just a matter of adding a, another special election into the C-SMART CFIS system saying, okay, here's one public advocate race and it has the so one set of limits which you've already set up, here's a second public advocate to race which has a different limit and um, what have you. That's, that's one idea that we are exploring. As I said, we're exploring different administrative ways to accomplish this. Of course, there are public disclosure issues with two different special elections. So those people, the candidates in, would show up as in two different election cycles if we did it that way. So that's one of the ideas that we are exploring to make it more efficient. But again, there are other you know, downstream implications from that. Your indicate so I, I just, I appreciate you're willing to work together. Do you, did you happen to know that I'm a software developer? We have we have staff on very who are very familiar with our software and our system, our legacy system, Kifis, and are uh, diligently working on that. So, if if, if you believe uh, that for whatever reason you are having difficulty, would you be willing to let me sit down with your software development team and your source code so I can? Uh, see exactly where there may be room for debugging and improvement and better software code that would help facilitate things moving quicker. Well, we are, I mean, thank you, that's very nice. Um, I we are, our, <laughs> we have, have I do have a, a, a staff of professionals who are working very diligently on that, so hopefully we will not need to take you up and you can continue doing your regular day job. <laughs> I appreciate it. The uh, last item which I just want to follow the chair on is uh, you've indicated that you are concerned that 
rolling out this a, an additional option would uh, have a detrimental effect on audits for 2017. Uh, when you set your budget, which you set on your own for the fiscal year, did you contemplate that there would be a citywide election? The special election, yes, but this will probably divert addition, more uh, audit resources than uh, than we had anticipated because of the two systems. Um, again, you know, this is we're working on uh, the plan for how to accomplish this, but because there may need to be um, additional manual reviews or additional more detailed reviews uh, because of the two options, um, it, it may divert more audit resources than we had anticipated for the citywide special election. Is it possible to modify something like the city's budget to add the staff necessary to accommodate this and continue to walk and chew gum and, and text while walking across the street, as it were? I mean, again, as I said, we're looking into the administrative issues. We would like to try and uh, uh, we might ha need to add audit resources. And thank you for the offer of, to increase our budget. Um, you know, again, it is a very short time frame. So uh, we want to use the experienced staff that is already trained in doing the audits to uh, work on the 2019 special election. Uh, those are my questions. I want to thank the chair, and I had thanked him in my opening statement. I want to thank Keith Powers for being a co-prime uh, initial sponsor on this. Thank you so much. I want to recognize we've been joined Councilmember Perkins. And with that, let me just call on the way uh, Councilmember Powers. Sure. And, and thank you. And I'm sorry I missed your testimony. This is the most well-attended hearing today, if you didn't recognize Amazon is across the street so I had a so be you're you're very lucky I um, but thank you for your testimony as always um, I want to just pick up you know when when Councilor Kales was, was introducing the bill you know I thought that the voters had just spoken on this issue and that we should recognize their their willingness plus the administration had put this forward on the ballot and so recognize that that was what I thought was to put it into effect today. Recognizing special elections have different sets of rules, it's just sort of all around. Um, this, I don't know, I don't know if I heard this question asked, but so let me just repeat it or, or ask it. Um, this election is very quick. It's in February and I recognize the difficulty for that. There are folks who are in this body who, and, other, and in this body who are running for that seat. There are others who are pursuing other seats before 2021. Is there a timeline by which you think you could implement, if not February, by which this could be implemented for other special elections so that we're not waiting to 2021 to implement what I, the voters have just voted on in this administration and you know, initiated, which was to do eight to one matching amongst, um, essentially the eight to one matching. Um, so, you know, we're committed to, you know, to doing what the, if the council passes the law for the special election to meeting that deadline. And I, I appreciate uh, Council Member Cabrera's confidence in our staff. I mean, I just wanted to point out some of the possible uh, pitfalls that might happen in the quick um, in, uh, implementation. Uh, I don't, haven't really contemplated that, you know, when we could. I mean, we had been planning for 2021. Uh, obviously, the 2021 election is ongoing so we were making plans for implementing it uh, for some fixes for the uh, first disclosure statement where the full choice would be implemented which is in July um, and then in January so you know certainly by next January we should have most of the implementation done for those uh, for uh, uh, the 2021 election okay that's great and the and then this would leave people with the option to run under two systems immediately sort of today and immediately is that right and then to to council Mark Kalos's question if you are a candidate who has already raised money that money can be rolled over but it wouldn't be subject to matching funds if you've raised money in prior I guess cycles or like the the oddity of this race plus the idea of this race, I think, really is that you have uh, the timing of it and then the different sort of systems that are set up here. Um, so if you just to follow up on his question, if you have money raised today, that is not subject to that money is not subject to matching funds. But you can then input you then you can choose one of your programs and go into one one of the if, if this bill passed into A or B six to one, eight to one with different limits. And you'd have to start all of your fundraising from there to get the matching funds. Is that correct? Um, yes. yes. Confusing question. <laughs> I know. There was a lot for of me too. Yeah. And then having just the answer, yes, yes, they, they have that right. Yes. 
They'll st if they raised yeah. twenty five fifty, they would have to give back fifteen hundred fifty dollars yeah. if they chose. Yeah. If they choose option B, yes. yes. Okay. But everybody, I mean, so in a special election, the contribution limits are already half. So people uh, who had been raising money, anticipating a twenty twenty one election, were already already going to have to return um, contribution half the contributions that they had raised because the contribution limit for a special election is already half the. And if you had money rolled over from the last election cycle, you'd have to refund contributions to get them down. If you chose the eight to one yes. and the $1,000 or whatever the limit is citywide, you'd have to then re refund money. Yes, and, okay. and my point is that both people, you know, e under either system, you would have to either under option A or option B, the new system. Or right, because it's a thousand dollars, right, or whatever. Yeah, right, right. Okay, right. So everybody's got to. If you have, if you have raised, you have to refund. I ask some of these questions practically because this is a good opportunity actually for the twenty-five candidates who are running for public advocate to understand what the system is. They'll be they'll be living <laughs> under uh, for the next few months. Um, what other challenges do you have? It's it's how to pay. Just, I think, timing to get the software up. What are the other challenges in terms of, I mean, is an amount of candidates a challenge for you today if they all made the ballot? I mean, we, you know, we've, we would uh, handle the amount, of, you know, for the candidates. The, it's the, it's really programming the system, our, all of our administrative systems. So we have our database, internal database system, KIFIS, uh, which does, helps with the audit staff do their, audit reviews and to calculate the payments and to determine whether candidates have met the threshold. So that would have to be altered and there's a chance that if we cannot alter it, we would have to do some of those reviews manually. Um, then there's the warnings and uh, uh, information that our, so our disclosure software, CSMART, gives to candidates as they collect contributions to warn them when they're accepting a contribution over the limit. So those would all have to be changed for two uh, office it for two li different limits. Um, also two different matching rates in that and knowing whether you've entered a matchable amount of, uh, you know, depending right, on which right. system, 135, 250. Um, and then also the same concerns with our uh, software NYC votes contribute the online platform to collect credit card contributions. Got it. Thank you. And, um, uh, my last question is, I guess, special elections are so much different in so many different ways, nonpartisan, contributional and side. Have I know this is a this is a from a prior administration and prior time, but has there been any conversation or effort to maybe make the special I mean the idea that a special election pops up and you now have to live by a whole set of rules that are different than the way you're raising money before that. Has there ever been an effort to try to make the, 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 the laws and governing special elections and campaign finance sort of resemble those that would be ordinary here? Um, you know, there have been some changes to the way special elections. So um, a few years ago, the, uh, the matchable amount also was halved for special elections. And so that was the council uh, on our recommendation changed that to make it match because that was more, made it much more difficult. The This bill uh, will also have the threshold, which will make it easier for mm. candidates in special elections to uh, meet the threshold, which is always a challenge in the compressed time frame. The uh, Contribution limits match kind of the currently contribution limits apply across the entire election cycle for a primary and general election, and that's the theory why the contribution limit is half. Uh, the spending limit is you know, for uh, for a primary, then there's spending limit for the general election. So it's this the spending limit for a special is the same as the spending limit for a single election. So it's the same. Got it. And my sorry, this is my actual last question. Uh, any any challenges you have heard from the candidates today who are running? or about uh, fundraising for this election, either in terms of structural challenges or, or around the law that um, have come up as common questions or complaints or concerns? I mean, you know, we have been in the process, you know, of answering questions and providing guidance for all of the potential candidates in that election. Um, you know, a lot of questions about transferring money, a lot of questions about the contribution limits. So they've all been trained on what the law uh, rules are 
at this moment, um, you know, we will do our best to do outreach and to explain the two different options if this law passes. Okay, I appreciate that because it's a lot, a lot of candidates and not everybody can afford a lawyer to help them go through compliance and stuff like that. So more, I, I have to say, you guys do very, you are very proactive. I, there's no, I have no, I have no concern about that. But I, but I certainly think in this particular instance, with the timing and the amount of candidates, proactive is a is a good approach. And I think some of the smaller candidates who are getting in, or or state candidates who have never run under this system. Um, certainly will need some assistance here to help. And, I mean, we, we, of course, have our candidate guidance uh, division who will provide guidance and prepare uh, documents for the candidates and to do trainings for them to make sure that everyone understands the rules that they're operating under. Thank you. I'm sorry for taking so much time. Uh, I, and I do have to run. I'm sorry. Uh, but I uh, but thank you. And thank you for your willingness to be cooperative with, with our effort here. Thanks. Thank you so much, Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Madam Director. Uh, I share my colleague's confidence, uh, by the way, in, in your ability to work well under uh, limitations that are not of your making. Um, after 9-11, uh, the agency was able to regroup at Fordham and uh, managed to get the payments out. And after Sandy, you were able to regroup in a new location. So I, I, I am confident that even though you, you are literally uh, in uh, uh, this is not of your own making and if you have to comply you will but I, I know you can it doesn't mean I agree with it and it doesn't mean I think you should have to um, but I just wanted to tell you that um, during the course of the Charter Commission's uh, conversations that they were having about how to implement question one and when to make it and obviously they made a choice that the question they would present to the voters was to make it effective uh, for the 21 municipal elections and to specifically uh, exclude elections held prior thereto. Did you have conversations, did your agency have conversations with the Charter Revision Commission to let them know that there would be some kind of problem uh, or it would be difficult for the agency to comply if it was asked to, uh, to do this effective immediately, as it were? Yes, we did have those conversations. So presumably the Charter Revision Commission, uh, the wise beings that they are, when they presented the question to the voters, and the voters, uh, the wise beings that they are, um, uh, was, were aware of the choice that they would be making, which is to make this effect of the 2021 election. Yes. Okay. In my district, by the way, uh, the voters chose no. Um, my district is the only district where the voters chose no on all three questions. We are very wise there. Um, but uh, my, my voters in my district did not, uh, did not wish to abide by the Charter Revision Commission's demands on them. Um, but, but my point is that, that uh, your agency had conversations with the body that was presenting this question, that was designing the question, that was framing um, uh, a, uh, a framework, didn't mean to phrase it that way, for what the charter would look like, and presented it to the voters based on uh, your your knowledgeable and experienced conversations, and that was what the voters chose. Yes. Okay. I'm going to read something to you. We are disappointed the council is considering these significant changes to the campaign finance program only 10 months before many of its members will appear on primary ballots. The act requires the board to issue its recommendations for legislative changes three years before the next election. The timeline provides for the ample time to assess the potential impact of changes, discuss the policy, and ensure their smooth implementation. These recommendations are informed by and supported by comprehensive analysis of the data from the previous election and our experience administering the program. That's that's I, you. Yes, okay. I recognize that. And, <laughs> and you made a lot of sense when you said that. And this is not a critique in any way. This is to, this is to bring out, and this is the only way I really know how to ask questions is in this <laughs> format. Um, it's my training, unfortunately. But um, when the council two years ago deliberated about significant changes uh, in some view, uh, insignificant in other view, important changes in some views, maybe not important in other views, the position of your agency was, don't change the rules in the middle of the game. Is that a fair way to paraphrase the position that you were taking? Yes, especially at the late t date that that was in the election cycle. Literally adopted 10 months before the primary. 
Yes. And candidates were raising for three years prior there too? Yes. Okay. You've had some experience with special elections, uh, your agency. I, I have as well with your agency. Um, and so at this point in the calendar, you can make an educated guess as to approximately how far away we are from the special election. Um, well, the, the vacancy will occur on January 1st. The mayor will um, have will issue probably a proclamation on January 2nd. Uh, the election has to occur within 45 days. So I think if I, my calculations are correct, the latest it could be is February 26th. Right. So that's my calculation as well. And uh, um, either February 19th or 26th, the, the mayors like to make these on Tuesdays. Uh, it's about 80 days from now. It's much less than 10 months. Yes. Okay. We urge the council to delay consideration of many of these proposals until after the 2017 election. This would allow for a thoughtful analysis of their impact and deflect accusations that members are seeking advantage for their own campaigns. Enacting these proposals now will disrupt the board's preparation for the election year and require hasty decisions about implementation. Do you think that there has been thoughtful analysis of the impact of the changes, well, let me rephrase that, and I'll withdraw that. Have you been able to, uh, I'll, I'll leave out the word thoughtful, but has your agency been able to fully analyze the implications of the changes that you're being forced to undertake? Well, we had um, uh, obviously, you know, started thinking about the implementation of the 2021 charter changes after they were passed, after they were recommended in September, we started talking about them. Um, and we have, you know, as this bill has been introduced, been thinking about how to administer and the implications of it. And that's the basis of my testimony. Referring I, to when I, you I guess I, 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 no, I just want to I mean the recommendations that were in the charter the, the charter referendum and the with and the same these are based on those same uh, recommendations were based on the analysis from our analysis of the 2017 election so I don't want to be leave you with the impression that the where these did the H1 and the 250, all of those were based on our analysis of the program in the 2017 election and, and part based on our recommendations. And Madam Director, that's, that's my point to you, is that you, you engaged in a thoughtful analysis, I believe you did, in a thoughtful analysis about the implications of the discussions that the Charter Revision Commission was undertaking as it relates to 2021 with the, with the specific knowledge that if the voters were to adopt it, uh, this would be in effect in 2021. If the voters were not to adopt it, then you know all systems go as they were. Um, but that was the thoughtful analysis that you undertook because that was the set of facts that you were presented. And here we are 80 days or thereabouts prior to an election, and you're being asked, uh, not asked, you're being told by this council, because this will pass. Um, uh, you know, this, it, a bill doesn't get introduced on, on Tuesday, heard on Wednesday, if it's not gonna pass. Um, so, you know, that's, it's not going to have my vote, but it will pass. Uh, the, the, you're, you're being forced to engage in this, notwithstanding the fact that, um, that your thoughtful analysis came to the conclusion that this is not a workable thing for you to do. You know, as I said, you know, before, I mean, these are our concerns. Um, we absolutely will do the best that we can to make sure that we protect the uh, taxpayer money, as we always do, that we uh, pay out the public funds to candidates if the, as they're entitled, that people will have the guidance of our staff and, um, <clears throat> and to the extent possible for our computer systems. Okay. In your view, does it make sense for candidates in the same race to operate under different sets of rules? As a matter of good government, as a matter of the overseer of, of fair elections in the city, two candidates in the same race, three candidates in the same race can be operating under three separate sets of financing rules. Do you think that's fair? Well, they're not three sets. I mean, it's a non participant, option A, option B. Well, the non participants are. For these for these elections until the uh, until the charter fully takes effect after the 2021 election when there's no option, um, they their non <coughs> non participants operate under option B. 
So there will always be. Well, not no non 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 participants. Forgive me. I'm sorry, but non participants op operate under option none of the above because they can self fund if they choose to. Yeah, self funders are and, different. And yes, so that's obviously. a whole new set of rules for for the very special wealthy. So so really three different kinds of groups of people may be running or non participants who don't choose to self fund, but. Uh, but can go out and raise, and I guess those people would be option B people, except that they're not taking public funds. But of course, they wouldn't have caps. So three separate rules, broadly speaking, for three different kinds of candidates. I, I can say that we, you know, uh, we're not in favor of giving candidates a choice. We thought it was best to have one system for candidates. I Obviously, non-participants, you know, self-funders always operate under a different system under the Constitution, so that there's always that difference. But you know, we didn't, uh, we were not a, a proponent of the, giving people a choice between two different systems. And and uh, are you able to share any insight into why that? Uh, that was ultimately the offer that was made? I mean, that's the Charter Revision Commission's recommendation. I think it was because some candidates said to the Charter Revision Commission, hey, uh, we don't want you to take away our money. And if you're gonna change the rules of the game, let us keep what we have, because we can take up to 5,100, Eric, it's okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna speculate I, on we, their, their we, ratchet. We can oh. take up to $5,100 yeah. right now and uh, you know you're going to change the rules, and then we're going to not going to be able to take the 5100. Don't take away our money. By the way, um, 20 years ago, the same thing happened when uh, when corporations were no longer able to give after 1998, and uh, in 2007, when LLCs were being banned, the same thing happened. There was this rush. Everybody knew the rules were changing. Let's suck up all that money about to be banned prior to the deadline. Uh, after which they will no longer be allowed. So here are these candidates, whoever was smart enough, fortuitous enough, uh, me not being one of them, I don't have a committee open yet for, the, for a different cycle. Um, they were sucking up the big cash and they didn't want to have the rules changed and require the money to go back. So, so what we were given as a choice, voters in my community having wisely opined otherwise, was uh, don't worry about it. Uh, candidates who have already sucked up the big cash, you're going to be able to keep that money. And we're going to make a whole new set of rules with a big fat taxpayer check for those people. And you'll still get your fat taxpayer check. It'll just be a little tiny less. And to illustrate, um, right now at 55%, which would be the option B, a uh, candidate for public advocate can get $2.5 million if they fully raise. It's a lot of money. I mean, we can $2.5 million hires at least a couple of school teachers. And under this system, option A, the maximum would be $3.4 million, a $911,000 increase. $911,000 hires at, at least nine cops. Um, and, you know, clearly what the system that we're setting up here is a system which has inherent hypocrisy. You don't have to say yes or no on that. Um, inherent unfairness because we, we have candidates who will be able to, in this special election in 80 days from now, we have candidates who will abide by option A and say, I'm only going to take $1,000. And we have candidates who are going to say, that's okay by you, but you can do that if you want to, but I'm taking 2550 Is that fair? Leave aside the, the, the Valley of Buckley people who can spend whatever they want, but is that fair that within a public financing system itself, we have well as i said you know we were not supporters of the choice i mean the we are proponents of the the goals that the lowering the contribution and, limit and increasing the matching rate will increase the amount of small donors in the process um, reduce the influence of big money and the appearance of corruption so uh the recommendations you know the option a recommendations um are Ma based on our you know the stated goals of the public financing Program. So I, I, I appreciate the, the diplomatic answer, but honestly, you know, you, you, you're a voice on this issue, um, not just here in the council, you, you, you travel to other cities, you talk about the program here in New York, it's, the, it's, it's nationally recognized, I mean, it's the first of its kind, it still is the first of its kind, it still is the best, I don't think there's something better out there that's fairer, that encourages more people to get in. Um, uh, you know, I was, I was outspent uh, 
three or four or five to one. Um, uh, but if, you know, and, and I was stuck in the campaign finance program, can't get out after a certain point in time, but, but the program was good to me because I complied with the rules and, and because of that, the covenant between myself and my government is that if I do my part, the government will help me because I'm limiting my ability to take money from various sources and, and I'm abiding by a cap, which my opponent did not, but the government will say, here's $100,000. And in this race, we're basically saying the government's going to say, you get 100, you get 150. Uh, or, to be more precise, you get 2.5, you get 3.4. So my point is, I appreciate the diplomatic way you're saying it, but my question really is, because, because you are a voice on this, is it fair that we're in an election where they're, and leave aside the self-funders who have the constitutional right to do as they please, that we have two sets of candidates, both of which have their hands out at your front door, asking for you to give them a check of our community's tax dollars. And one candidate says, I'm willing to limit who I take money from to an appropriately low level of $1,000 a person. And the other candidate says, no, no, 2550 is mine. Give me my money. Is it fair for two sets of rules in the same race? Is it fair for a government to set up rules deliberately, leaving aside the things that are out of our control, like the constitutional requirements. Is that fair? I mean, again, this is the choice that the Charter Revision Commission gave the voters and that the voters voted on. Um, so, I mean, again, you know, as I said before, opinion. You know, think my opinion, my, our opinion is that having a choice is not, um, you know, is not the Can best. I think that has no, because you don't want to say no because you're diplomatic. Okay. Got it. All right. All right. Fair enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go on that. Uh, um, uh, there was a conversation about paper checks, and and I, I just want to state for the record that um, and you can you can answer if you wish, but I'm gonna state it because I, I feel it needs to be said that it's a paper check issued by the city of New York. It clears uh, overnight if you take it to your teller window. Um, it's it's good money. I promise you, the city had 90 billion dollars. We have it. It's good money. Um, uh, after the um, uh, uh, after 9-11, when, when the offices had to move, be moved over to Fordham, uh, the agency was issuing paper checks requiring people to come and pick them up. Um, I don't know if that was always the process then, the paper check process, but uh, paper checks were, were a thing in the 90s, were a thing in the 2000s. It's not a big deal, by the way, in my campaign. Um, nearly every single bill was paid by check. I think it's the best practice uh, for, for the bookkeeping back and forth so that there can be an actual printed record of how the item was negotiated versus um, versus a wire transfer. So I, I don't have a problem with the paper checks and I trust your agency in issuing the paper checks will will be fine with that. I mean that you were correct that in the past, you know, it certainly in two thousand one, um, all checks were issued by paper. Okay. And and the, the automatic transfers were something that was that were really just done in the last uh, decade. I, my recollection is since two thousand nine uh, two th I, I think it might have been in the two thousand five election. I yeah. just have to okay. look. Um, Real quickly on war chests. Uh, how, I know you don't. You didn't put a clock on me, Mr. Chairman. How uh, you want you old? I have nothing on my calendar today. I'm here all day. <laughs> when I have one of these things on, I I block off the rest of my day. And I came in early. You know, I was, I've been here since 4 a.m. Um, I'm kidding. I really wasn't. Uh, you, I I want to clarify um, a, a misperception, perhaps, um, and, and uh, that that Ben is not here. But we we talk about this, and I guess he'll be back. Um, the war chest thing, there's two different pieces of war chest. You know, I, I, get, I get the notion of, you know, we don't want politicians accumulating huge, you know, these gi gigantic barrels of money and that they can go spend it on whatever they want. But your agency uh, under the Act, under your rules, has very, very strict limitations on how previously raised funds can be used. So in essence, there are two sets of war chests that apply to this race, if you will, and there may be others that I'm, but for, for our purposes here and based on what I know about the candidates, war chest A is uh, the candidate who's been raising for this race, but because um, uh, the mayor hasn't issued the order uh, to declare an election, you have not set up a system for a special election. That's the way the process is supposed to work. So therefore, they're raising under 21 rules, but they know there's going to be a special election. We all know that. So that's war chest A. 
And that's not really a war chest because that's, yeah, that's, that's not going to yeah. revert yeah. to the current committee. That's the way yeah. it works. And then there's candidate B who has a pre-existing city committee um, with an accumulated amount of funds, uh, has no pay repayment obligation, uh, so therefore the money's just sitting there, and now can take the money, float it into a new committee using LIFO, and also subject to limitations. Yes, I yes, described the, the right. current limitations. Okay. Okay. So yeah. every dollar, Eric? Whether or not you're I always want to hear yeah. right? yes. Yeah. yes. It's, it's whether or not you're a participant in the program. You That money whether is or subject not. to Either way, yes. correct. Yes. That was the 2016 yes. amendment. Okay. So the, the, the notion that, that a war chest somehow is inherently bad, the money, the only funds that we permit under the act to be freely transferred um, are, are funds that were raised under act rules. And even then, they can only be freely transferred subject to LIFO limitations. And even then... Um, they can only be transferred in subject to, within the existing committee, that particular contributor to whom that contribution is being attributed cannot then give. So, for example, if I gave my good friend Jamani Williams a check for, for you know, twenty-seven fifty when he was running for city council last year, and he still has money in that committee, and he wishes to transfer over the twenty-seven fifty that he has from me, he can't do that. He can transfer under option A only up to a thousand dollars, and then I can never write him a check again in this special election. That's correct. Okay, so war that, chest. That is, was my point about that we have a lot of protections to make sure that the money. I is agree, not. and and I want to make sure that when we talk about war chests, we we are very very clear that in the city of New York under our system, war chests are not a thing. It's it, because the 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 prophylactic measures put in place to prevent candidates from simply walking around with huge chunks of money, the only thing that we can't do is prevent the self-funder. Um, but other than that, it's not a, we don't have a war chest thing. And we do have a candidate who, who has a committee open, but that candidate will be required to abide by, uh, and it's, we believe a 2017 committee with some funds left over, that candidate will be required to abide by the transfer in using LIFO, and of course those who have contributed will be limited in what they can give. Okay. Right, just, I was a nod. Yes, okay. yes, that's correct. I wanted that's to make sure right. they transcribe the, uh, yeah, the video yes, onto yes. a transcript. Okay. Um, all right, I, I don't want, I, I appreciate your time. And, and I, want to, I want to say uh, this because, um, you, you know, you know me for a little while. Um, uh, and you know, it's not, we don't have a personal relationship. It's not we're not friends. I mean, no, we're not, not enemies. <laughs> I know you for a long time. I'm looking at my chairman. Um, uh, but but you know my work. I know your work, and I I I do admire, admire very much uh, the work that you do. Um, uh, I think that th I just want to say this while I have the mic here that um, it's not often said that I agree with you. Um, I'm going to say that out loud. I do agree with you. I think this is I think this is something that that's being forced, and it's it's um, you know I, I don't believe you're going to make mistakes on purpose, but I believe that your agency will make mistakes by accident because you do have a large number of people running. You have the number of staff that you have now. Going out and hiring 16 more auditors or campaign finance people is not going to help. You need to be trained. There's an election happening tomorrow. This is not. This is not something that you pick up overnight. You just read a manual and now you can go out and do this. And I am very, very concerned about, um, and I've always been concerned about this with regard to your agency and rules and as they apply to candidates, when uh, the rules that are in effect serve to perhaps hinder the choices and the availability of choices and the ability of people to get out their message and when people think that they're operating under a set of rules and all of a sudden they find out that what they thought isn't the case, and obviously in, in a very limited amount of time, a mistake can't quickly be reversed to undo the mistake because by the time you turn around and, you know, it's over, the election's passed. And, and I am very, very concerned, uh, and I share your concern as uh, maybe I'm, I'm wording it a little differently, but I share the concerns that you've brought forth in your testimony that um, no agency should, should be forced, not yours, uh, which is not a mayoral agency, but not any agency should be forced by this body uh, to, to undergo a set of changes. Um,
that don't allow for a thoughtful analysis of the impact, and surely that uh, will disrupt the board's preparations for the election year, require hasty decisions about implementation, implementation. I thought that you had a good point two years ago. I did. I th thought you were wrong because I, I, I think that the changes being made then, and we, Eric and I have had conversations, um, I think that the changes that were being made then didn't require you to change your systems, which was a key difference in what the council did to you two years ago, or for you, if you will, um, and what's happening now. You didn't have to change your systems, you just had to change some policies, which is different. But here you're being forced not to just blow up your existing system, but to create these, these competing systems that run side by side um, that test each filing. I mean, you didn't discuss this, but I know this and you know this, that each filing is tested by your system for compliance in certain aspects, right? It's run against the doing business database. That's not a human being that does that. That's not machinery. That's a machine, yeah. Right. And, and uh, it's run against uh, contribution limits database. And, you know, but for the guy who pushes the wrong button, that someone who's operating under option A, option B, you know, all of a sudden he gets a report, you're being denied public funds because you took an over-the-limit contribution. What are you talking about? I'm an option B. Uh, I don't have an over-the-limit contribution. These are real concerns that I have. I know you have them too. I know you're going to work hard to make sure that that's not the case, but human error is human error. Machines are machines. These things are going to happen, and I am very concerned. I do share your concern. I will not be voting for this bill, uh, not as currently written, that's for sure. Um, although I think that option A is, is wise in the sense that uh, it does serve to lower the contribution limits and ultimately uh, uh, take money out of politics and make, uh, uh, make it a fair election. I will also point out that in the last, your, your manuscript here, uh, in the last uh, election cycle, the average individual contribution to the public advocates race was $354. The most recent, the most frequent individual contribution was $100. I don't see the big money people of New York falling all over themselves to throw money at this job. I think I've made the case that not really many people know what it does. I sure don't. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that this is um, a solution in search of a problem that really doesn't exist. And there is a good reason that the Charter Revision Commission took your advice on not implementing it. Uh, prior or earlier than 2021. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for your indulgence. Madam Director, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, we often agree and this one I, I disagree with you, uh, which is good. Uh, this is what we do here. Uh, the fact is that, uh, uh, if I may, uh, people already have thrown big money into this race. There are candidates uh, that have received large amount of money from big time donors already. And so, because that's the way it was established. I do believe that option A is superior to option B, but we're talking about transition. Uh, I, I wish we could just go with, with option A for all of the candidates, but in fairness, to those who were under the assumption as they were um, collecting their, you know, their checks and, and contributions, in fairness to those who had that assumption, I think that option should be given. And so I, I think at the heart of the fairness that I see here uh, is for those who for a few years uh, they were not anticipating for this to, uh, to take place. Um, and again, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna close with uh, what I said at the beginning. I have full confidence uh, in your leadership. Uh, both of you are veterans. Uh, this is, uh, you have bigger tasks that you have confronted before, I'm talking about a few candidates. As a matter of fact, I think this is going to be a grand opportunity uh, to prepare you for the larger election that we're going to have in 2021. Uh, and so with that, I thank you. Thank you so much uh, for taking uh, up uh, this challenge and for all the information you provided today. I really appreciate that. And so let me move on to the last panel. We have uh, one So let me take the opportunity to thank you and to wish you a happy new year. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Likewise. Uh, Morris Pearl from Patriotic Millionaires. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's okay. Hi. Hi. Feel free to uh, start whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Cabrera, and thank you, members of the Council. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to appear before you and for the thoughtful discussion you're giving to this important issue. I agree with um, Member Yeager that New York City has the greatest campaign finance system of any place in the country and, frankly, any place in the world. I'm, we're currently also advocating a system like New York for statewide elections and, in fact, for federal elections as part of um, HR1. My group, the Patriotic Millionaires, represents hundreds of wealthy people from around the country who are really profoundly concerned at the growing inequality and the growing, growing influence of just the wealthy people here in our country among our politicians. I'd like very much, as, I'm sh as the goal that you all share, to get big money out of politics, especially my own money. I have far too many people running for office, for the Senate, for the House, from all over the country, who are not spending time with their people, but who are instead coming and visiting me and talking to New Yorkers about making large donations and funding super PACs and things like that. And so I'm hoping very much that New York can continue taking the lead to get big money out of politics. This is not to help the politicians. This bill, the one thing I disagree with Member Yeager about, is this is not to help him. This is not to help you running for office. This is to help the people of Brooklyn make their voices known. And so you, as council members, as, as people running for elected office, do not have to go around and be talking to the wealthy business developers and real estate people about getting $1,000 donations this is so you can spend your time not with people like me, but talking to your constituents who you represent and giving them the same kind of power that the wealthy and the elite have now. I supported campaign finance reform. I spoke in favor of this bill on many occasions in October and in, before the election November and I was in favor of it implemented in 2021, so I'm in favor of implementing it now um, now for the, uh, the elections that are upcoming also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I don't know what, it, I assume all millionaires are patriotic, at least American millionaires, but I like the name of your organization. Um, we have noticed a few who are not, actually, okay. unfortunately. That's fair enough. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Director Lopress. Do you think it's fair for candidates in the same election to operate under this different sets of rules, and in this case, three different sets of rules as it pertains to campaign finance? Well, if we're, talking, if we're talking about leveling the playing field and making it, and, and making it reasonable for our voters to know <coughs> that the government that they're going to get is one that didn't solicit the $5,100 contribution, is it fair for people in the same race to have two different sets of rules? Well, I mean, as you noted, there's the constitutional issue around self-funders. That's why I left out the self-funders. Putting um, that aside, sure, I would be in favor of the option for the new rules for all candidates, for all offices. Do you think that it's that it, if, we, if we're not doing that, because we're not, I'm, I'm not going to say, right. you know, I'm, it's not a secret. The bill is what the bill is. This is what the bill is going to be. Uh, this is what the law will be. Do you, do you think it's better to just do it partially? In other words, leave it up to those candidates who decide, well, you know, I want a little bit extra in the public funds, so, and it's the, so I want the 8 to 1 on the 250 instead of the 6 to 1 on the 175, so therefore I'm not going to take 2550s, which I probably couldn't get anyway because, being honest, it's the public advocates race and nobody cares. So therefore, I'm going to just limit myself to the $1,000. And then one or two candidates say, no, thank you. I, I know where I can get my 2550s from, and I'm just going to take those. Well, obviously, each candidate has the option to choose whichever they want. Why so is I that think, right? Well, Why I is that fair? Why is that the good thing that we're doing, that we're, letting the, that, we're, that we're giving the candidates a choice? Candidates are not supposed to decide what's fair in an election. The government decides, and the people decide. The um, candidates are going to decide. My chairman, I'm going to wait until he comes back. Um, he, he went to vote on other 
Yes. Okay, well, then I'm going to say without my chairman, but I'll tell him later that I said it. My, my chairman said it's about fairness to the candidates. Well, Why do we care about fairness to the candidates? Well, as you said, it's not up for the – I mean, I agree that there's no public purpose for the candidates to make the rules, and I defer to you as the council members. So can you tell us that we're wrong? Because I know we're wrong, but some, some others in the council may not know that we're wrong. Isn't it better to say no – we're not going to give the candidates a choice between the fat largesse of that gigantic check that they're going to get from the taxpayers or that fat largesse of the check that they may or may not be able to solicit from the wealthy patriotic millionaire. But instead, we're going to say, no, this is the rule. And the rule is $1,000 is the limit, not $2,550. Well, Shouldn't we say no to this because it's a bad bill? If I was a member of the council, I would support a limit of $1,000 okay. for all of the candidates. And right now, this bill says that the candidate, you decide, uh, uh, Mr. Pearl, to, to run for a public advocate. Maybe you're a great person. I assume you are. You seem like a fine person. And you say, you know what? It's wrong. I'm not going to take $2,550. I have a lot of wealthy friends, but I'm not going to take $2,550. So I'm going to limit myself to $1,000. But maybe you say, I want to win. And I know where the money's at, and the election is in 80 days from now. And I got a lot of friends who are also patriotic millionaires, and they're going to write me checks. Should you have that choice, or, or should the rules be the rules for everybody? Well, I'm not running for public advocate well, or you're, any you're, elected office. You and, uh, you and this table are the only few people in New York who aren't. Um, that's fine. There, um, certainly, I'm glad there are many people who do want to be involved in running for office, for running for public advocate, and other offices. I think that's very fortunate that we live in the city of New York that has many people that do want to get involved. And sure, yeah, I would be in favor of lower contribution limits to apply to everyone if I was, you know, drafting the bill. So shouldn't we say no to this bill unless it makes it not a choice but an obligation that this is the rule for this election? Well, I defer to you as the What's elected member of the city council. If you were council. sitting right here between me and my friend Councilman Kalos, what would you, how would you vote? Well, I think having some people use the new system is better than no people using the new system. That's where we disagree because I think that's inherently unfair. That people are you go are, people will uni unilaterally disarm, if you will, um, and and they'll have one set of rules, but we'll have another set of rules for other people, and then the chips will fall where they were where they may. And and you know, because you're a businessman, you will know that people are going to make the decision that makes the most sense for them, and they're going to say, well, I have a better shot at getting those low dollar contributions, so I'm going to roll the dice that my eight to one is going to work out because I can't get the twenty five fifties anyway, and somebody else is going to say. You know, I may do okay with the low dollars, but at six to one, that's generous enough. I have a lot of people who are going to write me 2550s. Let me roll the dice with that. You know, I, you obviously represent hundreds of thousands of people in Brooklyn, and I defer to your judgment and what's best for your Very diplomatic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you came down to, uh, to testify. I, very, I, I appreciate your involvement very much. I appreciate the effort that you and your colleagues are making on this Thank work. You. I, I want to... Uh, uh, so I just want to thank uh, Morris Pearl from Patriotic Millionaires for coming down. Uh, you, you've had a chance to see the uh, democratic process more and more up front from community board meetings on bike lanes to this. Uh, I will say that uh, uh, Councilmember Yeager is one of the, the, the foremost experts on election law and campaign finance. He actually, that was his previous occupation before he gave it up to serve in the legislature and uh, I look for and 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 uh, he will. I, I assume, as uh, as a citizen legislature, it is something that he will one day go back to doing. Uh, so, I, I will just uh, jump in with uh, my my colleague to just say, uh, sometimes I go to a restaurant and I order something and they get my order wrong, and sometimes I look at it and I say, okay, how wrong is it? And so, like you, I, I'm kosher, not like you, I'm kosher style. So I'll eat vegetarian outside. And so like if, if I ordered something and I said, please, no meat, and they give it to me and it's covered in bacon and sausage and, and other pork products, I'm, I'm going to send it back. Because uh, in, in my faith, if, if, it's, if, they, if it's touched the traif, it I believe the word is tuma. And, and so like... This is not the only reason we get along so well. But <laughs> that being said, if they send it to me and I said, you know, I wanted the... Uh, eggs over easy, easy and I wanted hash browns but they give me a salad instead I think I'm okay 
And so I would say that I, I too agree I would prefer the United States Constitution be read a lot differently than the current Supreme Court. I would prefer to not have to have a system with options where billionaires like Michael Bloomberg can run on their own system and spend hundreds of million dollars while everyone else has a different system. But I will say that uh, I, I, having another option to me is, is not, doesn't make the whole thing trafe. But my friend, uh, it's your bill. Yes. And just write it the way you really want it. And you're ordering from the menu. Decide what you want and, and say option A should be what it is. We don't have an option B, not when Ben Kalos writes the bill. And that's the bill, because you should write that bill. What, what we're talking, and that's what, uh, and by the way, this is the rare time that we get to debate, so in front of open mics. Um, uh, and don't, don't really don't uh, judge us wrong, because we, we are good friends, and uh, he's, he's very right on this. His goal, Ben's goal, is to get big money out of politics. He's going down the road that he thinks it can pass. And what I'm saying is that if this is really what we want to do, we have an election in 80 days, tell those people who want to raise 2550s, no. Not in New York. And, and, and I, what I will say is in talking and reaching out to various candidates, I think one of the things that I've heard from candidates, I know you had asked the CFB, is they felt the threshold might be a bar. And uh, we've, I've heard that from mayoral candidates in the last election, and that's why we're lowering the threshold. I, I will tell you that a lot of the candidates are very concerned about the fact that we're saying that this has to be retroactive and if they took 2550 that they have to return it. So I, I can tell you right now I believe it will limit participation, but I think it's the right thing to do. And ultimately, in 2021, we will not have however many systems, option A will come off the table. And I think I was just trying to do it as simply as possible, as close to question one as possible with those additional two changes. This is uh, what happens when Mr. Chairman's not here to watch it's, us. It's, it's, it's okay. Uh, and so I, I guess to uh, Morris, uh, do, you, do you have occasion to have elected officials call you? Um, more often than I prefer, actually. I turned off my phone during the hearing here. Uh, because the, the assumption being that in the hour that you have been here that uh, you would have gotten multiple solicitations for money? Unfortunately, that's all too common. Uh, so you're, you're a, you are the person that people in office, in this case there's 14, I, my, my colleague says 14 candidates for public? Uh, there are, is, is, are more than a dozen candidates for, for public advocate. Many of them are elected officials. I, I believe many of them are, are reaching out to you. Why, why pass this? Why support question one uh, versus being the one that they talk to versus other people? Well, I, mean, f I hope that we can come into a system where they don't have to have lots of call time, where they don't have to be stuck in little offices dialing people like me or hanging around in you know my living room trying to explain to me what the public advocate does. Um, you know, uh, I would hope that you and your colleagues, who those who are running for public advocate, would have more time to actually deal with the legislation of the city and with dealing with figuring out the needs of your constituents, particularly those who don't make $5,000 donations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, with that, uh, last, pan last panel, Alex Camardi, reinvent Albany. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for your patience. Alex, you can begin as soon as you're ready. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Chair Cabrera. My name is Alex Camarda. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for reInvent Albany. reInvent Albany is a government watchdog organization which advocates for open and accountable government. 
The bill before the council today will enable candidates running for special elections beginning in 2019 to voluntarily opt into the new campaign finance requirements approved by, approved by voters on election day in 2018 and placed on the ballot by the 2018 Charter Revision Commission convened by Mayor de Blasio. The new campaign finance requirements will lower co campaign contribution limits to $2,000 for candidates opting into the city's public matching program and 3,500 for non-participants. Match donations eight to one for the first $175 of any contribution and enable candidates to raise 75% of their campaign money from public funds. And has, as has been pointed out today, for special elections, these contribution limits are half the amount. Uh, reInvent Albany is a strong supporter of these voter-approved campaign finance reforms, believing they will amplify the voice of small donors and ensure all New Yorkers can participate in our democracy. Uh, we testified six times before the 2018 Charter Revision Commission, including as experts on campaign finance reform, and worked with Council Member Ben Kalos to get a majority of Council members to support his legislation to increase the public match cap in 2017 and 2018. We emphatically supported these reforms overall because they were substantial improvements. However, we opposed at the time the new campaign contribution limits, public match rate, and public match cap being phased in instead of taking effect immediately. Reinvent Albany supports this bill because it puts in place the reforms for special elections between 2019 and through 2021. The benefits of implementing these reforms immediately for special ele elections outweighs our one reservation, which is changing the rules of the game mid-course for the upcoming public advocate special election. However, most candidates in the special election for public advocate, at least according to the most recent filings, have not raised a lot of money and would therefore likely opt into and benefit from the public matching system. In the last race for an open seat for public advocate, Tish James, Dan Squadron, and Reshma Saujani all raised more in public than private funds. This demonstrates the need for the voter-approved campaign finance measures so special election candidates can rely more heavily on public funds for their campaigns. Reinvent Albany believes this bill could be strengthened by also immediately putting into effect the lower contribution limits passed by the voters for candidates who choose not to participate in the public matching system and run for office in a special election. For public advocate, non-participants will be able to raise $25.50 per donor rather than the new lower contribution limit of $17.50 passed by voters in November, but not going into effect until 2022. Maintaining the current contribution limit of 2550 will discourage candidates from participating in the public matching system. We also believe the council should repeal the option allowing candidates to remain in the old system in the 2021 primary and general elections. The voters have made clear they want a reduction in contribution limits and a higher public match rate and cap. This should be put into effect immediately. Reinvent Albany also notes this bill halves the contributions and money raised thresholds to qualify for the public funds program for citywide office. It also lowers the amount candidates have to spend to qualify for the first debate sponsored by the Campaign Finance Board. Both of these amend amendments we also support. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Councilmember Kalos. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Camarda, for your advocacy, um, can you tell me a little bit about how you were able to get a majority of council members signed on to the original full public match? Is it the advocacy that was just done by your organization, or were there other folks who were uh, passionate about lowering the amount of money in politics? Uh, well, as you know, council member, you had convened a group of, I think there was maybe 20 some groups at the time who were in support of your legislation. And uh, we and other groups notably represent us, which is a national organization. Um, we made many communications to council members via email, phone calls, uh, and other forms of contacts to talk to them about the legislation at that time. And, and we uh, were able to get a majority support on the bill. And I would also note in 2017 uh, at the speakers forum that uh, Citizens Union held, every one of the speaker candidates also supported the bill at that time. And then the mayor, of course, picked it up when um, the 2018 commission was convened and it became part of the measures that were on the ballot and approved by the voters with over 80% of the vote. In your, a prior 
position that you held was at Citizens Union, which engaged in endorsement activity. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, my, my colleague feels that it is unfair, uh, and not to put too many words in his mouth, but that it is unfair for there to be multiple systems. Uh, do you believe that organizations like Citizens Union, where you previously worked, or even reInvent Albany, uh, or partners that you work with like Common Cause, or even editorial boards like the Daily News and New York Post and New York Times, uh, might help in terms of uh, encouraging candidates one way or another by setting as a standard that if a candidate does not opt into a system with less big money, that that w might be a litmus test such as getting rid of outside income or Lulu's. Is that something that groups such as yourselves and others that you work with have done in the past and are likely to do? And I, I, I really can't speak for the other groups. I will say that um, when I was involved in Citizens Union in the endorsement process, certainly like any organization that runs an endorsement process, they have positions on issues and they tend to evaluate candidates based on those positions. And the, obviously with the good government groups here in the city and the state, they've tended to support uh, campaign finance reform, including a public matching program. So I think that was part of their evaluations. But I can't really speak to specifically uh, whether it's been a litmus test, not to my knowledge. I, I, I would argue um, that... I don't believe outside of one particular billionaire that uh, there's ever been an endorsement of a candidate who didn't participate in the campaign finance system. And I would caution, and if we were able to pass this through this committee, uh, despite uh, so, some objection, that uh, I, I hope that groups like yours and others would consider this as a litmus test, and that certainly the, the New York Times, Daily News, and New York Post uh, would also consider whether candidates completely opt out, choose option A, or in this case, choose option B. And I would also hope that the Campaign Finance Board and its voter guide uh, include an indication of whether somebody has opted out, uh, chosen option A or option B, uh, because I think that is something that would be important to the voters. Do you think that having such a disclosure in the voter guide that is mailed to all voters in the next however, in, in 80 days or so would be helpful for voter decision making? There's no, there's no voter guide in... We online for special Okay, I've been advised by my colleague to my right and a member of the audience that there's only going to be an online voter guide, but would an online voter guide disclosure of participation in the system be instructive for voters? You're asking me whether the, the voter guide would be instructive or the proposal that you made about the voter guide? Uh, whether or not the voter guide, including what type of but whether they chose not to participate, option A or option B would be helpful in an online voter guide for voters. I think more information, more transparency is always beneficial. The more we can educate voters about uh, candidates' positions on the issues, including whether they opt into a public matching system, I think is something that voters will be interested in. Uh, and then I will just note that I believe you and my, my colleague, Councilmember Yeager, agree that the option shouldn't be there. Um, and uh, I, I, I would be happy to work with uh, you and or he, should he wish to introduce legislation on this point, uh, to, to make it so. Uh, but um, if, if we aren't able to add this request that you're making, uh, is, is the order wrong enough that you have to send it back, or would you support it if we were not able to make that one amendment? Uh, as we indicated in our testimony, so we, port, we support the bill as is. The, the amendment that we were suggesting was actually lowering the contribution limit for non-participants effective immediately, which I believe it is not. Um, and we think that would help encourage people to opt in to the public matching system for not only the upcoming special election for public advocate, for, but for also for subsequent special elections. And... Consider if it. the council was to consider putting this into effect immediately for all races, meaning the measures approved by the voters in 2018, we would certainly support that even more. Consider the legislative request submitted. Okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, your testimony to that today. And with that, I want to thank all the staff. Uh, and my colleagues uh, for today's hearing. I'm looking forward 
uh, to getting this uh, bill passed uh, in the very near future. And actually, no, actually I did have one more question. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I did have one question. I'm sorry. I was doing a closing before. Uh, will you will reinvent Albany? Uh, what are your thoughts regarding uh, people who already had an account open and grandfathering those who want to be in option A? So, for example, if I, I have an account open, uh, I want to go on option A. Now I'm obligated to go back to my donors, give them their checks back to get it back again. What are your thoughts of just grandfathering anyone who wants to go on option A since it is a superior and a better option? I, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I mean, so option A being the measures that the voters approved exactly and you're asking whether to grandfather those things for people who want to run in 2021 for example uh going let's say i want to run in 2021 going back uh in, and i have an account open right now and uh and i want to choose option a now i have to wait until january what is it 12 or 14 uh before all of the all of the contributions after that, then it will qualify for option A, or I'm obligated to return checks and and have them uh, write a new check or give online because anything prior to that does not qualify. So my understanding, and I obviously defer to the campaign finance board on this, but and I think uh, Council Member Yeager spoke about it before. I, my understanding is if you're raising at the current contribution limits or the contribution limits for option A, uh, that that money could then be rolled over into your new account. Uh, and if the amounts above the contribution limit would just have to be refunded to the, to the donors. Well, um, but if you were actively in your mind thinking I'm going to abide by option A, you could just raise contributions now under those limits and then move the money over. That but was that's, my up to, that's up to uh, 2021. So everyone who's running 2021 does not have the options. So for this bill right now, it only allows for people, as I understand it, it only allows for people who are running the special election or any elections between now and 2021, but it does not cover people who want to run in 2021 uh, f who receive contributions prior to January the 14th. Did I confuse you? Yes. So <laughs> let me use myself as an example. Let's say I raise $100,000 prior to January 14th. Uh, which would be nice. Uh, so I raised a hundred thousand uh, dollars, and I got checks of uh, any check that I got there. None of the monies that I raised prior to January 14 will qualify for option uh, for option A. None. I will not get the eight times one. Only people who are running in this special election all the way to 2021. So will you be open and support, because it is a superior option, uh, for people who are right now uh, in this situation to be able to automatically uh, opt in and not have to return checks? It seems to me the easiest thing to do would just be put into effect immediately what the voters passed uh, in 2018. Otherwise, mechanically, I would think that would be very complicated to administer. We've already placed a burden on the campaign finance board by having to administer these two separate systems in 2021. It seems like the easiest, most efficient, cleanest way to do this is just to put it into effect immediately. I mean, the reason we support this bill is it, it gets us part of the way there. It does it for special elections. And we are looking beyond the immediate special election for public advocate. And we think it will be beneficial for all the special elections which may occur between now and then. 
and that outweighs the concern that that council member Yeager raised, which is that we're changing the rules of the game for this one particular special election part of the way in. And since you mentioned council member Yeager, he gave me the nod that he would like to make a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is a concern that I raise, but I'm not the first to raise it because, uh, as I indicated earlier, I'm sure you were in the room, uh, Director Lowprest uh, indicated her disappointment that the council is considering these significant changes to the campaign finance program only 10 months before many of its members will appear on primary ballots in 2017. She also indicated that, um, that the delay of considering it so short before an election would uh, allow for a thoughtful analysis of their impact and deflect accusations that members are seeking advantage for their own campaigns. Do you think that's, um, that's something that merits concern that the council with at least four members of the council, some prior members of the council, but at least four members who are current members today, uh, is about to pass a law that's going to that's gonna open up the city's safe uh, to all who wish to enter and grab the cash? I think it's concerning any time you change the rules of the campaign finance system uh, during the election cycle. Ideally, we would have a system in which the campaign finance board issues its annual report and then the changes are made subsequent to that for the next election cycle. Um, unfortunately, you know, the realities are things people tend to focus on things when they're uh, occurring rather than in advance. And so we have to balance that with um, making the system better. But it's definitely a concern and it's something we acknowledge and, and did in our testimony. You uh, you indicated a few minutes ago that you uh, would have that I, I'm paraphrasing because I didn't take a note, but that you would prefer, would have preferred uh, that there be one system uh, that the that the referenda adopted uh, a few weeks ago would create would have created one system for the entirety of the cycle, essentially from January 12th of 2018. That's when the cycle begins under the Campaign Finance Act through the 2021 elections. That would be your preference. Right. Although I would note, even with the measures the voters approved, I mean, one of the arguments that commission members raised at the time was even with the voters approving measures, we were making changes in the middle of the cycle because, as, to your point, it had already started by the time the voters considered the measures. And my point is that in the past, when the council had made changes to uh, what is a what constitutes a permissible contribution, and three times that I can think of them of the council having done so in the last two decades. In 1998, um, I'm sorry, in 1998 it was the charter uh, passed a law requiring that uh, city candidates could no longer accept corporate contributions. So up until December 31st of 1998, candidates were running around the city to anybody who wanted to write a corporate contribution, give me the money, and in 2007. Uh, the council passed a law uh, banning LLC and LLP contributions and also instituting a doing business law that took effect later. So again, until the uh, taking effect date of that law, everybody was running around town getting the LLC, LLPs. And then even though everybody knew that the doing business law would take effect, that wasn't put into effect until sometime into, over phases until sometime in 2008 and then uh, the remainder in 2009. So in the same cycle that somebody was running uh, either in, in 2001, some had corporates, some had, it, it, while they were running in an environment that corporates were no longer legal. In, in 2009, people were running, some had LLC, LLP, uh, doing business contributions exceeding the limit. So it's true that rules get instituted in the middle of the game. But my point to my, the point of my question was that the voters voted on this. You're not here to tell us voters are dumb. Voters had a date in their, in their question. This is when it would take effect. What would you, would you like me? What, what would? What is your message to the voters? Made a mistake? No, I mean I think we, we agree with you. We we believe that the changes the voters approved should go into effect immediately. So we right, we but are the on the same page in the, that regard. But the, the I, voters, I was merely pointing out that. Um, when the voters voted on it, we were also in the middle of the cycle. And I, in an ideal world, 
any changes to campaign finance reform would go into effect in the next cycle. As you pointed out, in many instances, that's not the case. Um, the in changes the real, in that the, real the voters world. voted on had a date in, in the question. It had a date of when it would take effect. It's not that the voters voted on something and then we're deciding when it should take effect. I, I would well, say voters. Mo- I would say choice. most of the voters who voted on that ballot proposal did not know the effect of voters are dumb. Is that what you're saying? No, it's when you looked at the question. I mean, first of all, we can talk about the ballot design, but the 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 question was on the back of the ballot or page four, as Councilmember Kalo said. The print was incredibly small, and in that summary, there was. Uh, I believe a reference to the effective dates, but I'm not sure that every voter who went in and voted on that clearly understood all the, the as nuances said, of it. You would have to read the the language that actually amended the charter. I presume all the voters are fully educated on all the questions that they were presented with. That's the presumption I go into it with. Um, uh, as I said before, in my district, uh, all three questions lost. It was the only district in the city where all three questions lost. I hope you're not telling me that my voters don't know what they're doing. I'm not making any okay. statements about your voters. All I'm right. merely saying that I don't think every voter uh, understood all the nuances of the effective dates of so, the so amendment having, they voted So having for. been stuck with, uh, with, with, with the ramifications of the voters' actions, which is a referenda adopted, a uh, series of questions, and now and the questions are what they are. There was a commission with open... Uh, an open process. They decided what the questions would be. Everybody knew what the questions would be. It had a date on it. Nobody was running around. To, I mean, I, I, maybe I missed it. I don't remember hearing from you in September that maybe, tell me if I'm wrong, that Charter Commission, you're wrong. Don't do this. You're wrong. It should take effect immediately. What are you doing? I, did I hear? I mean, maybe I missed it. Did your organization say that? Put out any kind of release that said Charter Revision Commission's wrong and they ought to do it right away? And, and, and what kind of backroom deal is this? Just like the, the 1989 backroom deal that created the office that I'm trying to get rid of? Uh, we, we actually did oppose the, um, the implementation that was created. But it, did you urge that- no vote? You're, no, because we looked at the totality of the proposal. And even now, it, as we are doing with this bill, we thought the benefits outweighed the costs. And so we support more public funds for candidates. We supported lower contribution limits. Uh, we would have preferred that it went into effect immediately. It did not. So when we looked at all of those things together, we supported the proposal. And uh, it, but it, we did at the time, and it came about after the end of the public hearing process, we did at the time communicate that we supported having it go into effect immediately rather than an option for candidates in 2021. As I described earlier, uh, the and which you've alluded to, uh, uh, two candidates in a race or three, one can decide to not participate at all, has the 2550 limit, uh, can sell funds, so it can raise 2550 from people, but also can just take in whatever they want um, from their own pocket. And then there's option A and option B. Option A is the $1,000 limitation, of which they get eight to one on 250, an extra $2,000 in uh, tax money that won't go towards hiring a teacher. And uh, option B is a lesser amount, six on the 175, which gives them total of about $1,500 or thereabouts. Um, and so you're going to have in a race people who's, you know, and as I said, candidates are going to make the choices. Let's be honest, right? There are a lot of people running on my friends. I like them very much. But the candidates in this race are going to choose what makes the most sense for their success. And if a candidate decides that what makes the most sense for his or her success is option A, because they, can't, they don't have access to the 2550s, but they know they could raise a lot of small dollar contributions on the internet and whatnot, and that's what they're going to do. And if a candidate says, you know, my small donor universe is not that great, but I know a lot of 2550 fellas, I'm going to go do that. And so you're going to have in a race people who are taking different monies from different places. There's, it's not a level playing field because they're all making guesses about what makes the most sense. You think that's fair for a city to set up a system like that? Deliberately, not by accident. We're not do- this is not an accident. It's not something that's just going to happen because nobody was watching. This is something that we're doing. We're making this happen. An unfair system. Do you think that's fair? I, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. What I what we've testified is we think that the um, 
the ballot measures approved by the voters should go into effect immediately. So should we think that's the, that's the ideal, that's the most desirable. So I mean, to your point about candidates having different circumstances, some with access to larger donors, some with access to only smaller donors, uh, I mean, that's just the reality of of those candidates' experiences. I, I don't know whether that makes it fair or unfair. It's just they're coming into it at different points so, based on Mr. different Kumar, backgrounds. As you know, because you've been involved here and at Citizens Union, Bills get written here in the council, and then they get heard by a committee, they get passed by on the floor, they go to the mayor, he approves or disapproves, etc. The starting point is the council, and there's a bill that provides this choice. Shouldn't we say no unless that bill is right? Why, why should, wouldn't you tell me as a council member, vote no on that bill? It's not right. This is what we prefer. I mean, with every bill, you have to balance the ideal versus something that you think is good. And we think there's a lot of good in this bill in that we're not just looking at you this have the immediate of special the bill. election. I mean, you, you have, have, the spe- authors of the bill you have right special here. elections that for the next four years, you're, you will have candidates who raise more public funds and are able to opt in. And we think that is an overarching good thing and outweighs, as I mentioned, the one reservation we had about changing the rules of the game for this one particular race. So for us, it rises to the level of being uh, good for the reasons I just mentioned, and therefore we support it. Would we prefer that the changes went into effect immediately for all races, not just for special elections, but also primary and general elections? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, and I want to recognize that we were joined also by Council Member Mysel. I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you. for your advocacy. Thank you uh, for your voice. Uh, you are making a difference. And with that, uh, I want to thank again the staff for the wonderful work uh, that you put into uh, today's hearing. And we conclude today's hearing.